This is the these aggressive instincts turned inward. The entire world originally, sorry, the entire inner world, originally thin as if inserted between two skins, has spread and unfolded, has taken on depth, breadth, height, to the same extent that man's outward discharging has been obstructed. Those terrible bulwarks with which the organization of the state protects itself against the old instincts of freedom, punishment, sorry, the terrible bulwarks against with which the organization of the state protects itself against the old instincts of freedom, namely, punishment belong above all else to these bulwarks, brought it about that all those instincts of the wild, free, roaming human turned themselves backward against man himself. Hostility, cruelty, pleasure and persecution, and assault, and change, and destruction, all of that turning itself against the possessors of such instincts. That's the origin of that conscience. Um, so, that's also going to be interpreted in a certain way as uh, the basis of, of morality. So on the one hand, this so socialization that restricts our um, discharging our aggressive instincts against one another through often brutal punishment, preventing us from doing that, doesn't make those instincts and desires go away. It just means that we're no longer able to discharge them outwardly. Uh, so this is, I mean, I, I want to say again, this is the brutal process that he's been talking about all along here, where um, we're tamed. And, and and it's a brutal process because that's how you make human beings uh, internalize those aggressive instincts. And so on the one hand, Nietzsche says, this internalization generates a new kind of suffering, uh, one that didn't exist before. Uh, on 57, line 23. In him, the greatest and most uncanny of sicknesses was introduced, one from which man has not recovered to this day, the suffering of man from man, from himself. Okay, so this directed, this uh, redirection of our aggressive instincts um, makes us suffer from ourselves. But, he says, let us immediately add that on the other hand, with the appearance on earth of an animal soul turned against itself, taking sides against itself, something so new, deep, unheard of, enigmatic, contradictory, and full of future had come into being. So this is also, in addition to creating a, um, a new kind of suffering, he says this is the creation of a new kind of creature, not merely animal, uh, something with psychological depth or soul, something that's so full of the future that the appearance of the earth was thereby essentially changed. So you can hardly overstate how important each of things this is. Creation of a sovereign individual whose aggressive instincts are turned inward, creating a depth, uh, change the face of the earth. Um, so in addition to the suffering, um, there's this wonderful creation as well. Um, So, although we, although Nietzsche thinks we're still suffering from 
this internalization of our aggression. Um, Um, this is also what elevated us beyond at our merely animal existence. It, this is what gave us the possibility of achieving truly great things, higher achievement. Think of it this way. Mere animals don't make promises. Mere animals aren't sovereign individuals. And, to anticipate just a little bit, Mere animals don't make art. So for Nietzsche, it's this internalization of our aggressive instincts, disciplining ourselves, that is the basis for creativity. The, so I, I alluded to the brutal process of disciplining ourselves through punishment, through burning in a memory. And this is what he's talking about still in section 17. Um, the origin of society, the origin of social institutions was not a peaceful contract that individuals made prudently on the basis of their mutual advantage. The origin of society was a, a terror-inspiring thing when one group brutally conquers another and forces them to submit to their discipline. Um, so um, this kind of brutal domination is the origin of society. Um, and for Nietzsche, it's only after individuals have been uh, tamed. It's only after individuals have internalized their aggressive instincts that we're going to have, uh, we'll be able to move away from uh, reactive feelings of resentment and have law, which we just talked about. Um, and it's also only after societies have become strong by creating sovereign individuals that uh, they'll be able to ease up on the brutality of the punishments that they inflict. So last time I think I read this passage where um, a very strong society would have the privilege of being able to grant mercy that violations would not uh, jeopardize it, would not harm it, and so it would be able to shrug off um, violations without requiring um, these kinds of brutal punishments that were required earlier on. Okay, so it's not, so in the earlier stages of the formation of society, when these brutal methods are necessary, um, it's not it's not the conquerors in whom um, bad conscience and guilt develops, but in those who are conquered and suppressed. Um, so when, he says, when conquered and disciplined, the will turns inward. Um, the very bottom of 58 onto 59, this instinct for freedom forcibly made latent, we've already grasped it, this instinct for freedom, driven back, suppressed, imprisoned within, and finally discharged and venting itself only on itself, this, and only it, this, is bad conscience in its beginnings. Section 18. This is the, it says, internalization of the instinct for freedom, look at line 12, 11 to 12. He says this internalization for this instinct of freedom, when it's turned back and inward, he says, um, this instinct of freedom, or speaking in my language, the will to power. I believe this is the first time he used this phrase here. Uh, 
Um, so here he's taking the will to power as, a, as equivalent to the instinct for freedom. So that's just what we've been talking about. The aggressive, instinctual desires, the desires that we have to feel our will uh, put out into the world. So the desires that we have to make the world reflect us. That's the will to power. The instinct that we have to remake the world in our image as we want, and to achieve our desires in the world. Okay, that's turned inward. And so rather than be able to express or vent our will to power on the world, it's turned inward on us, on ourselves. So 59, uh, this instinct for freedom, or speaking in my language, this will to power, so it's a, a psychological problem, and a, a kind of drive, a uh, natural instinct or drive that we have. Um, so here, this is internalized. He says, this secret self-violation, like the discharging of our will to power on ourselves, this secret violation, this artist's cruelty, this pleasure in giving oneself, as every resisting suffering matter, a form, in burning into oneself a will, a critique, a contradiction, a contempt, a no, this uncanny and horrifying, pleasurable work of a soul compliant, conflicted with itself, that makes itself, that makes itself suffer out of pleasure in making suffering. This entire active bad conscience as the true womb of ideal and imaginative events finally brought to light, one can guess it already, a wealth of new, disconcerting beauty and affirmation, and perhaps for the first time, beauty itself. Um, so this is what I was alluding to a moment ago with creativity and art. Um, so, over on uh, page 60, um, the very top of page 60, um, Section 19. This bad conscience, this guilt that we have when we discharge our aggressive instincts on ourselves internally, says it's a sickness, bad conscience. This admits of no doubt. But a sickness as pregnancy is a sickness. So it's full of creative potential. It's painful and unpleasant and makes us suffer from ourselves. But it also gives birth to things of value. It also gives birth to our creativity and our ability to, well, make promises, but also to achieve, to discipline ourselves in the process of creativity. Okay, so really what he's talking about here now in section 19 is how this idea of um, guilt gets connected up to religion and how it gets connected to a moralized understanding. So we're still not at morality, as I'll explain. Um, Okay, so he suggests here in section 19 that um, people in societies, in these early societies, viewed themselves as being in debt to their ancestors who established these practices and traditions in the society that they are now living in. Um, so we have, again, a kind of pre-moral model of predator and debtor so that the individual is in debt to 
his or her ancestors who established these practices.